Hello and welcome. I'm Joel Thierstein, President of West Virginia Wesleyan College. May the joy of the season fill you with happiness, and if that happiness hasn't found you just yet this year, may today's celebration spark the blaze of happiness. Welcome to the Festival of Lessons and Carols. Good evening. My name is Gavin Wilson, and I'm Student Senate President. I want to welcome you all to the Festival of Lessons and Carols and wish you all a Merry Christmas. How you doing, Wesleyan family? This is Kobe Vinegar. On behalf of the Black Student Union, as well as the Brothers of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated, by way of the Pi Mu chapter, we just wanted to wish you guys a Merry Christmas. Hope it's a prosperous one. I hope everybody's out there staying safe. Don't forget to wear your mask, and don't forget to save a plate for me on Christmas Day. Merry Christmas. Have a good one.
to your people of God. In this Christmas season, let it be our duty and delight to hear once more the message of the angels, to go to Bethlehem and to see the Son of God lying in the manger. Let us hear and heed in Holy Scripture the story of God's loving purpose from the time of our rebellion against him until the glorious redemption brought to us by his holy child, Jesus. And let us make this place glad with our carols of praise. But first, let us pray for the needs of his whole world, for peace and justice on earth, for the unity and mission of the church for which he died. And because he particularly loves them, let us remember in his name the poor and the helpless, the cold, the hungry and the oppressed, the sick and those who mourn, the lonely and unloved, the aged and the little children, as well as those who do not know and love the Lord Jesus Christ. Finally, let us remember before God his pure and lowly mother and that whole multitude which no one can number whose hope was in the word made flesh, and with whom in Jesus we are one forevermore. The Almighty God bless us with his grace. Christ give us the joys of everlasting life. In the fellowship of the citizens above, may the King of angels bring us all. Amen. As we hear these lessons and speak these words, let us remember how one night changed the world forever. Our first lesson is from Isaiah 7, 10 through 25 the prophet announces God's coming. The Lord sends Isaiah to give Ahaz the sign of Emmanuel. Not long after this, the Lord sent this further message to King Ahaz. Ask me for a sign, Ahaz, to prove that I will indeed crush your enemies, as I have said. Ask anything you like in heaven or on earth. But the king refused. No, he said, I will not bother the Lord with anything like that. Then Isaiah said, O house of David, you aren't satisfied to exhaust my patience. You exhaust the Lord's as well. All right then, the Lord himself will choose the sign. A child shall be born to a virgin, and she shall call him Emmanuel, meaning God is with us. By the time this child is weaned and knows right from wrong, the two kings you fear so much, the kings of Israel and Syria, will both be dead. But later on, the Lord will bring a terrible curse to you and on your nation and your family. There will be terror such as not been known since the division of Solomon's empire. The mighty king of Assyria will come with his great army. At that time, the Lord will whistle for the army of Upper Egypt and of Assyria too, to swarm down upon you like flies and destroy you like bees to sting and to kill. They will come in vast hordes, spreading across the whole land, even into the desolate valleys, caves, and thorny parts, as well as to all your fertile acres. In that day, the Lord will take this razor These Assyrians you have hired to save you and use it on you to shave off everything you have, your land, your crops, your people. When they finally stop plundering, the whole nation will be a pasture land. Whole flocks and herds will be destroyed and a farmer will be fortunate to have a cow and two sheep left. But the abundant pasture land will yield plenty of milk and every one left will live on curds and wild honey. At that time, the lush vineyards will become patches of briars. All the land will be one vast thorn field, a hunting ground overrun by wildlife. No one will go to the fertile hillsides where once the gardens grew, for thorns will cover them. Cattle, sheep, and goats will graze there. The word of the Lord.
Mary's role in the history of salvation is unique. Can you imagine the shock of the angel Gabriel's message? The same is true, however, for each one of us in a smaller scale. The Lord is with us and we have found favor with God. He has a mission for each of us to fulfill, even if that mission is not what we plan for ourselves. In our lives too, there are turning points where we may experience an invitation to embrace something difficult rather than discard it. This past year has provided challenges for many of us that we could have never imagined. Mary provides us with the perfect example of listening and trusting fully in God's plan. Pope Paul VI writes, Mary has always been proposed to the faithful by the church as an example to be imitated, not precisely in the type of life that she led, and much less for the socio-cultural background in which she lived. Rather, she is held up as an example to the faithful for the way in which her own particular life, she fully and responsibly accepted the word of God and acted on it. And because charity and the spirit of service were the driving force of her actions, she is worthy of imitation because she was the first and most perfect of Christ's disciples. Dear Lord, help us to remember that you are always with us in times of celebration and challenge. Help us trust, like Mary, that you will guide us and love us through whatever life brings us. Amen. Matthew 1, verses 18 to 25, New International Version. Joseph accepts his, Jesus as his son. This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was a faithful to the law, and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She gave birth to a son. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All, the, all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Jesus woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. But he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. We've had an interesting year in 2020, and from the scripture I just read you, it sounds like Joseph had an interesting year as well, some 2,000 years ago. It's interesting also that Joseph has no speaking parts in the Bible. One could logically conclude that Joseph dealt with his interesting year much the way Mary did. He kept all these things and pondered them in his heart. A lesson for us all. The fourth lesson comes out of the book of Luke, chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that the census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first sentence that took place in a while, and everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to marry him, and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. 
and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. The message I'd like to share with you today is the poem, The Birth of a Baby by Tom Krause. The love of God appeared in the night below a bright star, a wonderful sight. In a manger so humble, a child born so poor, with only the animals asleep on the floor. An angel appeared to shepherds below with a message of haste they must hurry and go. To see the new king of the world who has come, a gift from heaven from which he had come. When they arrived, they were not alone. Wise men from afar brought treasures to his throne, while Mary and Joseph took everything in, a heavenly choir sang a glorious hymn. The whole world would change in the glow of that night, by the gift from above in the gentle moonlight. Praise to the Father who sent Jesus his Son, with the birth of a baby, salvation had begun. a darkness over the land of Israel, Roman occupation and oppression, a ruler who is enamored of his own power. I've always found it hard to imagine such a world. In 2020, I found it much easier to understand that kind of a world. Racial injustice has been brutally exposed, even to those who pretended not to notice it. Social justice issues of all kinds have been highlighted. And all of this during a very contentious election, which has left us exhausted. And of course, all of this during COVID-19, which has overtaken the entire world, not just our little corner of it. Sickness, death, shutdowns and quarantines, economic impact of all of it has left many crying, hoping and yearning for help. However, during this darkest of years, something wonderful has happened in our family. A baby was born. During this darkest of years, I became a grandmother and a great aunt. New life, new dreams, new hopes. Such a natural and wonderful event, which is familiar to us. It is a universal experience, common to all, and yet full of mystery and miracle. To look into the eyes of a baby is to see wonder, curiosity, and raw joy. It causes the adults around them to see things more clearly to remember unabashed joy, to be tender, to be protective of this new life. To listen to the cries of a baby touches us deeply. Day and night, that sound causes us to feel called and compelled to soothe and assist. Our entire lives are upended, enriched, and transformed. So it has been that babies have brought light into 2020. So it was that God sent his son into the world for all of us. Mary brought forth her firstborn son. The lyrics of a song written by Mary Beale in 1988 sum it all up beautifully. Who would send a baby to heal a world in pain? Who would send a baby, a tiny child? When the world is crying for the promised one, who would send his only son? Who would send a baby to light a world with love? Who would send a baby, a tiny child? When the world is hoping for the promised one, 
who would send his only son? Who would choose a manger to cradle a king? Who would send angels to sing? Who would hang a star in the sky above to shine on the gift of his infinite love? Who would send a baby to bless a world with peace? Who would send a baby, a tiny child? When the world is yearning for the promised one, who would send a baby? Who would send a baby? Who would send his only begotten son? Sorry about the red nose, that's the treatment for skin cancer. So plug for sunscreen for your future, do it for yourself. Luke chapter two, verses eight through 21. In that region, there were shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them and the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, don't be afraid, for see, I'm bringing you good news of great joy for all the people. To you is born this day in the city of David, a savior who's the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You'll find a child wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace among those whom God favors. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go now to Bethlehem and see this thing that's taken place, which the Lord has made known to us. So they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the child lying in the manger. And when they saw this, they made known what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured all these words and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. After eight days had passed, it was time to circumcise the child, and he was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. When I was a little girl in church growing up, every year children got a piece to add to their nativity set. Each year, all the children in first grade got the same piece, and all the children in second grade got a different piece, and so on. Some years you might get a donkey. And some years you might get a cow. And one year, sure enough, we got a shepherd, a little shepherd boy with his sheep. Now I grew up in the city, and so I kind of took it for granted that the shepherd was present at the manger scene. Uh, I didn't know too much about livestock, and so I guess my little mind just thought, well, if there are cows and donkeys there, it sort of makes sense that the shepherd is there at the manger scene with the baby Jesus. But it's actually pretty weird 
that there were shepherds at the scene of Jesus' birth. See, the shepherds were supposed to be out in the fields doing their work. They were people that were not looked favorably upon in their society. They sort of had to do the dirty job. They were people that weren't special at all and probably had to leave work to go to Bethlehem and check out what the angels had told them. They probably were people who weren't around for important events. Their, their work didn't wait, just like farmers, seven days a week. And so it was unusual that these shepherds, these essential workers, were at the manger. They were the ones who did the basic work to keep their society functioning. You know, the essential workers, the people that we've taken for granted recently. All those people who work at the gas station and work at the grocery store, people that we say we really think they should get hazard pay or they should get a living wage or they should be able to organize in unions, all of these folks that perhaps we take for granted. But the ones who were taken for granted by people were the ones whom God was busy revealing special and wonderful news of great joy to. See, the angels didn't appear in the temple where heaven and earth were thought to meet. The angels appeared out on the farm with the workers. We can say it another way. The angels didn't appear in the church building, in the sanctuary, in the beautifully decorated space, but the angel appeared to the people who were taking a smoke break out back behind the BFS. We need to watch, watch out for who we take for granted because that's to whom God is speaking. And hopefully, we'll pay attention and get to overhear that good news of great joy. So be it. A reading from St. Matthew's Gospel. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, Wise men from the east came to Jerusalem asking, where is the child who has been born king of the Jews? For we observed his star at its rising and have come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened and all Jerusalem with him. And calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They told him, in Bethlehem of Judea, so it has been written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the wise men and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word, so that I may also go and pay him homage. When they had heard the king, they set out. And there ahead of them went the star that they had seen at its rising until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. Then opening their treasure chests, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. This is the appointed gospel reading for Epiphany, the feast day that concludes the 12 days of Christmas. My favorite setting of this story is Giancarlo Minotti's one act, one hour English opera, A Mall and the Night Visitors. It was commissioned by network executives at NBC in 1950 for television. Minotti wrote the opera with the inspiration of Hieronymus Bosch's 
famous painting, Adoration of the Magi. And also inspired by his own childhood memories in Italy, in which the three kings, Melchior, Balthazar, and Caspar, as they're named in Europe, played a much more important role than Saint Nick or Santa Claus. And so Amal is the story of a crippled shepherd boy prone to telling tall tales. He lives in poverty and obscurity with his weary, bitter mother. And when the Magi stop by their home on a cold winter night, a delightful story unfolds. But it's a story that's also poignant and profound. Tradition has it that one of the Magi was African. And so Minotti uses this to great effect in his opera. When the always curious, precocious Amal asks the black king Balthazar, have you regal blood? And may I see it? The wise man responds, it is just like yours. For Minotti's pre-civil rights era American audience, this was meant to say something important. I'll conclude here with my favorite lines of the opera. And as many times as I've seen it performed and listened to my favorite recording of it, and that would be many, many times, these words never fail to move me. And immediately before they are sung by one of the kings, Amal's mother in her hopelessness and desperation has tried to steal some of the king's gold. Oh woman, you may keep the gold. The child we seek doesn't need our gold. On love, on love alone, he will build his kingdom. His pierced hand will hold no scepter. His haloed head will wear no crown. His might will not be built on your toil. Swifter than lightning, he will soon walk among us. He will bring us new life and receive our death. And the keys to his city belong to the poor. And so as we celebrate the 12 days of Christmas and anticipate Epiphany, may the wise words from these wise ones remind us that the one whose reign is built on love, love alone, is the one we celebrate. Star of night. 
God and sacrifice. Alleluia, alleluia sounds through the earth and skies. O star of wonder, star of night, star with royal beauty bright, westward leading still proceeding, guide us to thy perfect light. Our eighth lesson comes from Matthew 2 verses 13 through 23. Now after they had left, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and flee to Egypt, and remain there until I tell you. For Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. Then Joseph got up, took the child and his mother by night, and went to Egypt, and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Out of Egypt I have called my son. When Herod saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, he was infuriated, and he sent and killed all the children in and around Bethlehem who were two years old or under, according to the time that he had learned from the wise men. Then was fulfilled what had been spoken through the prophet Jeremiah. A voice was heard in Ramah, wailing and loud lamentation, Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be consoled because they are no more. When Herod died, an angel of the Lord suddenly appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel, for those who were seeking the child's life are dead. Then Joseph got up, took the child and his mother, and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was ruling over Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. And after being warned in a dream, he went away to the district of Galilee, where he made his home in a town called Nazareth, so that what had been spoken through the prophets might be fulfilled. He will be called a Nazarene. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. This is not a cheerful part of the Christmas narrative. Instead, it is a rather dark and troubling part of the story. Power-hungry King Herod recognized that this baby was the Messiah, and that scared him. So he killed all the children two years and younger, thinking that Jesus would be one of them wherever he was. Little did Herod know that Mary and Joseph had escaped to Egypt. Immigration saved our infant Messiah. I wonder what would have happened in, if Egypt had turned Mary and Joseph around and refused them entry? What if they were allowed in, but Jesus was separated from them? How would our cherished story have gone? This passage reminds me that along with hope, peace, joy, and love, all of which are good things to reflect on and celebrate at Christmas, we are also called to practice radical hospitality. Jesus himself says that when we feed the hungry, give drink to the thirsty, clothe the naked, and welcome the stranger, we are really feeding, clothing, and welcoming him. Who can you welcome this holiday season? Who can we, as the body of Christ, welcome?
Everybody. Uh, my name is Joshua Stump and I'm going to be bringing you the ninth lesson this evening. And this lesson comes from the second chapter of the book of Luke. Uh, and in this chapter we find that Mary and Joseph have brought uh, Jesus to Jerusalem and they're bringing him to the temple to fulfill the consecration ritual. And on their way they meet a man named Simeon. And Simeon had been uh, touched by the Holy Spirit and moved to go to Jerusalem that day um, because he was told that he would meet uh, the Messiah before he would die. And sure enough, he uh, looks across the crowd and he sees Mary and Joseph with this baby. And he runs up to them in this absolutely beautiful moment. And, and he holds Jesus and he prays. He says, Sovereign Lord, uh, as you've promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace for my eyes. I have seen your salvation, which you've prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation for the Gentiles and for the glory of your people, Israel. And, and when I hear that, I hear this as a, as a prayer uh, and uh, as a uh, declaration of hope. And it's in this case, it's hope for his country and for his world, but it's hope for us too. It's hope for our world. Uh, it's hope for all of us uh, in his birth, uh, in his life, and in his death and resurrection. We find hope uh, in the story of Jesus Christ. And so I wanted to do just um, a, a couple of lines of a song called King of Kings that I think expresses that hope. <laughs> In the darkness we were waiting Without hope, without light Till from heaven you came running There was mercy in your eyes To fulfill the law and prophets To a virgin came the word From a throne of endless glory
love of the season find you wherever you are and bring you peace. Merry Christmas. Let us pray. May God, who by his Son gathered into one all of heaven and earth, grant you the fullness of inward peace and goodwill, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always. Stay safe and have a very Merry Christmas. Mm -hmm.